Welcome, everybody. It's May 18th. Thanks for tuning in for today's Burlington COVID-19 update. Start another week, a uh, busy week. We've got a council meeting again tonight, second week in a row. And um, we'll talk a little bit about the council meeting in action that is happening tonight. But we wanted to start off the conversation focused on something that I, uh, I believe is on a lot of people's minds, and that's food security. We, we have been concerned about food security during this pandemic from the earliest days. Uh, there has been a lot of effort that we're gonna give some updates on today um, about those food security initiatives. And um, at the same time, um, anyone who saw that line for food in Berlin last the end of last week knows that there is a huge amount of need out there. There are people, people waited in line for as much as uh, six hours, my understanding is, in that food line. And um, not everyone was able to get to the front of the line in the end. And we wanna make sure that is not happening here in, in Burlington, that people who, no one's going hungry uh, in, the, in this pandemic. So we've talked before about the feeding Chittenden efforts. We know that there, um, Demand on their programs has been up substantially during the pandemic. We know that Age Well has been serving even more people and had to really uh, restructure the way they're doing things to serve their population. We're gonna share some further information today about other programs that are helping to fill in the gaps and, and make sure that everyone who needs food is getting it in this, in this pandemic. We know that, you know, uh, all of our systems are being strained by this emergency. It has put um, just uh, the number, of, uh, the, the suddenness with which the economic conditions changed, um, put a lot of stress on an already fragile safety net. So we've been doing a number of things to try to fill in the gaps. The idea with this briefing is to make sure that we're spreading the word on all of the new programs that are happening out there so that people can access them um, and at the end, uh, I do want to, after we go through all this, kind of summarize and encourage people to continue to reach out to us um, if, they are, if they are in need of, of any help uh, regarding food um, now or in the weeks or months ahead. So let's, um, let's now talk about the Burlington Food Relief Program, which is one of the new initiatives started during this emergency. And one of the real leaders in that effort has been Will Clavel, who I see is uh, joining us here. And um, Will, why don't you, why don't you, you know, we talked about the food relief program on this briefing before, but it's been a few weeks. Why don't you bring people up to speed on, on what we've been doing and where this initiative stands? All right, thanks, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Will Clavel. I work for CEDO, and I'm just going to provide a quick update on two of the city's food relief programs. The first one is the COVID-19 Food Relief Pilot Program. We started this back in late March, as we're hearing from our local nonprofits that were experiencing an increased demand for prepared foods. At the same time, we had local restaurants that wanted to give back however they could. So we started this pilot program with a city investment and the goal is to deliver over 200 prepared meals to four local nonprofits every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And this program is intended to supplement ex existing efforts from feeding Chittenden and Meals on Wheels. So uh, some quick highlights. The way the program works is um, a restaurant will take a shift. So um, for each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, a different restaurant participates. They get a stipend with City Market. They'll let City Market what they're planning on cooking. City Market will deliver not only the food, but the packaging and the bags to that local restaurant. And then at 11 a.m. every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, myself and other local volunteers will pick up the meals and deliver them to local nonprofits. So including today's meals that were delivered, we've now um, delivered over 4,000 meals to nonprofits serving our most vulnerable residents, including youth facing homelessness, new American families, seniors, and the COVID-19 Recovery Center. And um, just wanna thank here, since the pilot program, we've see, received additional funding from United Way, Mascoma Bank, and the One Good Deed Fund to continue these good efforts before some of the other federal funds uh, reach the city. So thank you to those partners and thanks to all the restaurants who have partnered with us here. 
everyone from Single Pebble to Sweetwaters to August 1st to the Burlington Country Club to City Market. Really appreciate your support here. And um, the last program I wanna highlight is a separate food relief effort. This is a uh, Little Morocco food program. Little Morocco reached out to us uh, back in mid-March, just wanted to give back however they could. Every Tuesday and Thursday at four o'clock, they prepare meals for over 25 people that we then deliver to mainly larger new American families that are quarantining together. And these meals have gone to families living in the Riverside Apartments, Salmon Run, South Meadow, and they've gone to uh, support the Community Health Center on Riverside Avenue and the frontline employees there. And to date, they've uh, prepared almost 400 meals um, for free. So really want to give a shout out to Little Morocco for, you know, even a, during a time when they're struggling to make ends meet, they're going out of their way to feed our most vulnerable residents. So thank you to Little Morocco and happy to uh, elaborate on either one of these programs. That's a great summary, Will, and, and these are heartwarming um, initiatives. It's, uh, it is incredibly impressive that um, restaurants are, that are facing such times themselves are able to step up and contribute in this way. What, um, and, and the numbers are really starting to add up over 4,000 meals now. Are you, um, do we need more volunteers? Do we need more restaurants to get involved? What would you say the, the status of this project is right now? Yeah, I think at this point, you know, we would love to include new restaurants. So if this is something you're interested in, please reach out to me and I'm happy to plug you into the program. The other thing I wanted to mention is that over the past two weeks, we've actually um, seen an increased demand for food. I think some of the other initial programs have kind of reached their capacity. And so we're actually adding meals right now to this program. And so if you do need meals or you know, are no longer getting support from some of these uh, initial programs, please reach out to us and we'll, we're looking to grow the program. At this point, I think we're prepared to run this program through the summer, as long as there's uh, demand for it. So we're gonna be doing this for a while. And if you hear of anyone, uh, especially the local nonprofits that need food, please let us know. And thank you to all the volunteers who have taken time out of their day to deliver food. It's, it's been a great response from uh, mm -hmm. local residents looking to help out. Great. So when, when Will says uh, get in touch, really the easiest way to do that is through the, the Burlington Resource and Recovery Center. Um, this is, you know, hopefully people are, are, their awareness of the center is growing. This is the center that has put out banners around the city with phone numbers and email addresses. The email address is recovery, uh, right, Olivia, recovery at BurlingtonVT.gov, is that right? That's right. So recovery at BurlingtonVT.gov. You can also find all the information for the Resource and Recovery Center, right? It's a big, um, <clears throat> big um, link to it with a with a image. Uh, what, are, what are we using for the, the, the tile the, banner? Tile, yes. Thank you. There's a big tile right on the city's homepage. Thank you, Olivia. And um, there is also a phone number, which maybe could you list the phone number, Olivia? The phone number is 802-755-7239. So get in touch any of those ways with, if you want to help, if you need help, this is what the Recovery Center is there for. Well, um, so many people have said to me uh, in recent weeks that you're just doing an outstanding job. Um, you've been just a ball of energy and initiative since this began, and uh, I really appreciate it. And thank you. This program you. right here would not be uh, anywhere near where it is without your personal initiative. So thank you. Thank you, Marin. Thanks for having me on today. Appreciate it. Great. Why don't you stick around in case there's some more questions about this? Let's keep um, uh, talking about food. Um, the and we have Luke McGowan zooming in now, the CETO director and one of the heads of the. RRC, um, and this is an important change um, at the policy level, and one that I welcome um, and want to make sure that Burlingtonians uh, who need this are aware of it. So, um, Luke, why don't, why don't you summarize this, and, and uh, let's talk a little bit about this pandemic EBT benefit. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and again, thank you 
Will, you know, this program, there's a lot of people working on it, but, you know, Will's done a great job um, sort of launching this new food program. And I think it's, you made the point right, when you set up the city's response to this crisis, it was about making sure nobody get, goes hungry, making sure nobody goes without shelter. And that's what we've been focused on at the RRC. Uh, but a big part of what we do is helping people navigate to state and federal benefits. And so that's what we wanted to talk about here. Uh, DCF, they've announced this new pandemic EBT benefit. That's an electronic benefit transfer program to all families with children in Vermont schools who receive free or reduced price meals. And that's 35,000 across Vermont. And we think that's about 2,200 in the Burlington area. Uh, so they are announcing an additional essentially 400 bucks uh, of support through the Sweet Three Squares Vermont program um, per child. And so two important points that we just wanted to make here, you know, if you already have your EBT card, those benefits will flow automatically. Uh, but if you're newly, uh, you know, newly in need of these benefits, uh, you need to apply for the program. So there might be families who are now experiencing uh, food insecurity in this way, and there's a benefit there for them, but they need to apply. Uh, Look, this is huge, right? So this is a massive expansion in this program, right? It's multiplying it. If I saw the numbers right, it's like a three or four fold increase, right? That's right. But, but you're not going to, people have to find out about this program and actively sign up. People aren't going to just automatically be enrolled somehow or, or you know, that's right. So how you know, that works. Yeah, so it's the, you know, children and families who, you know, families who are already on the program already have their card, you know, those benefits will flow automatically, but it's, you know, families that are now newly food insecure, which we are confident there are many of them, given the, you know, depths of this economic crisis, that, you know, they need to actually actively apply. And so we, you know, at the RRC, we're ready to take calls to help people uh, to apply for those programs, uh, you know, today. What do you, how, how are the qualifications established? What, what, what do you, how do you qualify? It's, it's fairly simple. So if you go to the DCF website, there's a, there's a few different websites you can access uh, that ask for, you know, details just about sort of kind of what your income level is, what the emergency need is. Uh, but, you know, I just want to be really clear that there's no, Sort of shame or anything in applying for this benefit if you are have, if you are struggling to feed your children. You know the goal of this program is to give dignified access to food that nourishes every family in Vermont. Uh, and so if you have recently lost pay, you are probably eligible. And so we encourage you to fill out what is a, a pretty what I understand is a pretty short eligibility requirement form. Great, and that's three hundred eighty-seven dollars sixty cents per child. Is that a, a weekly? benefit? Is that a monthly benefit? I believe that's a monthly benefit, uh, but let me get back to you on that. They've said that additional benefits may be issued later, but as of now, that might just be the sort of pandemic benefit is just a one-time additional one -time. benefit. I see. Okay. All right. Well, um, again, so this is something, if you've been impacted, you're having um, challenges with food in your family. This is uh, a um, statewide program from the Department of Children and Families. You go to the DCF website, Luke, and that's where right. you sign up. So there's a few different uh, places where you can go. Uh, but, you know, if you follow that link, you'll certainly get information, but you can also apply uh, at hungerfreevermont.org. That will link you to the right place. You can also call 211. Uh, and you can also call the recovery center. So lots of options. ECF.vermont.gov is one clear way, but yes, thanks for those other ways. And if you ever get, get any trouble with that, if you have any technical challenges, any, any challenges at all, we want to hear from you at the resource and recovery center. So good. Thank you for, for fronting this. Luke. What do we have next, Olivia? Great. So here, this is another, so we just heard about a statewide effort, which I really think ultimately flows from the, the federal government. Now we've got on the other end of the spectrum, a very local initiative that has all been funded philanthropically and all, all organized by volunteers. And um, this has been going on for weeks. We have city councilor for the 
North District, Franklin Paulino here to give us an update on how the new North End Food Pantry effort is going. Franklin, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. It's very uh, refreshing to see all the different efforts and you know in one briefing that's going on uh, to to build on that. Um, you know, at the beginning when this happened, uh, people were reaching out, what can they do? And there's this volunteer food pantry in the New North End run by uh, Tom Flory every Saturday and Sunday, uh, 9 to 11. And so we decided to build on that and that resource. Uh, we raised uh, a pretty significant amount of funds in, in a short turnaround. And we have our next uh, grocery delivery. We expect to deliver 200 bags. Uh, we've been doing eggs, uh, milk, a gallon of milk, and uh, a dozen eggs, as well as bread. And this, we're, we'll keep adding to it. So we're going to have some BD uh, uh, swag, uh, uh, water bottles and such. We're going to have 200 RC masks. We're going to have um, some bow sauce and possibly some pasta. So we've had a really good, I, I would echo this, what, what you've said earlier that, you know, the need is great. And so people are showing up early. We're running out quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Paul and Councilor Mason and Councilor Shannon also did one last weekend and they're looking to do one next month as, as well. So something that started to as a one-time thing, but the need was so great and the re people were so receptive that we like to do it every month at the end of the month. And I understand the South End is gonna to continue to do that on that third week. And I certainly would encourage other counselors and would love to work with them to do something in the central and, and east districts. Excellent. Well, um, Franklin, I, I uh, really appreciate how um, you and Tom and Dave Hartnett and, and uh, Sarah Carpenter, I know many others have been involved in this effort. Um, I think, I think uh, Councillor Jang as well. Um, and it's, um, you know, I really appreciate just that uh, you guys uh, looked around, saw the need and figured out a way to make it happen. And uh, it's good news that it, it's going to continue. And yes, I think you really did help inspire the effort this uh, past Saturday in the South End, we had Karen Paul on the briefing on Friday to talk about that. And my understanding is um, that the food went very quickly on uh, Saturday, which I think is another indication of how significant the need is. So thank you for, for continuing to, to be focused and continue and keep this going as long as, as it's needed. Thank you. Um, see you tonight in a few hours, uh, Franklin, at the, uh, at the council meeting. So um, one of the most substantial day in day out efforts has been the work of the Burlington School Food Project. This effort distributes approximately 1600 meals every day to children under uh, 18, 18 and under at 11 different meal sites. We've talked about these meal sites a number of times on this briefing. It's also been a site where free books have been given out, masks were given out. Um, but the staple day in, day out has been these meals. Um, and we have some news to share about this and uh, more indication that, that work continues to happen in this, in this area. Uh, starting today, these heat up suppers, suppers that you can take home, warm them up, and they're ready for eating are going to be available at um, those two sites, the Boys and Girls Club and the Sustainability Academy sites. This is going to bring us up to almost 2,000 meals a day total. Excuse me. And uh, these heat up suppers are starting today available Monday through Friday. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm encouraged to see that the one um, concern I guess I had heard voiced about this program was uh, whether it was um, uh, meeting all of the different kind of tastes and whether there was some um, you know, some variety, enough variety uh, to keep people interested in these healthy um, meals and coming consistently. And this looks like an effort that really expands the offerings. The uh, food project is taking Monday Memorial Day off. And so there will be extra meals to distribute to last families through the weekend um, available on Friday. We very much appreciate our partners and really the leaders in this is the Burlington School Food Project, this uh, couple decade old, very um, remarkable um, <clears throat> food 
school-based initiative that really has long brought healthy meals to Burlington school kids. They've really stepped up during this pandemic. And I want to thank again the Parks Recreation and Waterfront team that has provided critical support at a number of these sites um, throughout, the, throughout the pandemic as well. Finally, um, uh, few a few final points on, on food. So one, um, we have talked in the past a couple times about Age Well's Meals on Wheels program. Uh, they have had this combination of increased demand combined with um, a challenge serving that demand because so many of their volunteers were from high risk groups. They were elderly themselves and, and many of their volunteers really didn't feel they could safely be out uh, delivering these meals. And um, uh, it's taken a major response from the community to, to fill that combined need. And I know the uh, United Way has helped organize volunteers and our RRC uh, and Zach Williamson have made a big push to secure volunteers. This is an ongoing thing, however. I mean, as long as we have large numbers of elderly Burlingtonians and Chittenden County residents essentially sheltering at home um, as they are recommended to more or less you know, to, to continue to do so by, by the governor, there is going to be an increased demand. And I think that we're going to have this challenge on the volunteer side. So anyone who has not yet signed up to support Age Well that is interested in doing so, you can go straight to Age Well's website pictured there on the screen. You can also, of course, uh, get connected through through the RRC. That, that program I referenced up at the top about uh, happening in Berlin was a state-run program. They're calling it the Farmers to Families Food Box Distribution. Um, essentially, this is uh, a way for people to get significant amounts of, of non-perishable food boxes along with produce straight from the farm, chicken, dairy products. And um, it's, it's, a, it's quite a bit of food. And this is what people were, this is a long line I mentioned in Berlin this past weekend. This is a program that is making its way around the state and it will be coming to Burlington, to the high school. This, um, that Saturday or Sunday, Olivia, it's uh, May 26th which is, um, today's the, so that, I guess it would be um, maybe next Tuesday, is that right? I think that's right, yes, okay. next Tuesday. Quick math, quick calendar math there. Next Tuesday, May 26th, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. here in Burlington. If you are interested in this Farmers to Families Food Box Distribution Program, um, uh, look for that and look for information on that. And we'll post information on the RRC site and uh, links to any additional information about how to, access that. I don't know if there if people need to sign up for that in any way. I think it's changing frequently, Olivia, right? So we'll, we'll keep pushing information out on that on that new program. And, and then finally, we just wanted to close, despite all these programs, I have this real concern that, um, again, our systems really weren't built for an emergency of this size. I'm very concerned that there are people going hungry in this community that we don't know about. If your family, someone you know, neighbor, um, anyone you think could benefit needs help with food, we want to know about it. And we're hope you know it's, we can't respond to these needs unless we're aware of them. So please get in touch with the Resource and Recovery Center if there is an issue, a gap that you're aware of. We really we want to hear about it so we can can try to solve it. I think that's what we've got on food security for now. Happy to answer more questions about that when we go to the questions. We, we did want to give a broader update on how the Resource and Recovery Center is doing. We are almost, we, perhaps today is the day that we go over a thousand inquiries to the Recovery Center since this began. You can see the stats uh, about why people have been reaching out on the, on the right. That is a graphic that we get by using this key click fix system that we pioneered about eight years ago um, and that Wellingtonians used to get responses to so many day-to-day -day routine issues. Um, this is being used to record all of the inquiries for help received by the RRC and that's how, where we get the pie chart from. Luke, what else can you tell us about the, the last week with the RRC? 
Yeah, um, thanks, Mayor. So I think we're kind of quickly approaching, uh, if we haven't already, you know, about a thousand tickets, you know, brought in, inquiries brought in. That represents again, you know, a hundred. I mean, sorry, a thousand different people in Burlington, uh, for the most part, looking for assistance of really any kind. You know, we've answered, um, you know, we've we've answered many different types of questions, and we've tried to capture the answers to those questions. Uh, on our website. So I encourage anybody who hasn't been already to check out the resources page. Uh, but you see uh, there's certainly been shifts over time, but we continue to get uh, many inquiries from sort of the small businesses looking for assistance, navigating benefits and guidance, you know, as the governor's orders continue to change and evolve. And as we start reopening or restarting Vermont, there's lots of details that need to be worked out. So we have a good team in place uh, to answer those questions. Um, and uh, we are also uh, continuing uh, to get a number of inquiries about how to volunteer. And so thank you for sort of flagging um, that fact that, you know, even, you know, AgeWell, we were on a call with them uh, last week uh, and with a number of our long-term care facility providers and AgeWell made a point of saying that so many of their volunteers have come through the RRC and they appreciate that, but you know, the need is still great. So we encourage folks to continue to call in. Uh, and I did, you know, just want to give one update. Uh, so if, Olivia, if you're able to go to the next slide, we have, uh, you know, I think it, this was a sort of good story that came out in Medium about the city's use of C -click Fix, And that's that platform that many in the city were aware of uh, to report potholes or, or trash in the green belt, which was important, but sort of different from any other uh, community in the country that we're aware of, we're using C -click Fix as the back end to support how the RRC tracks all of these different inquiries. And really importantly, it's how we follow up. So depending on which department is appropriate to kind of respond to the request and get an answer to the inquiry, we're able to assign those tickets out uh, based on kind of where the need is greatest. And so again, I just want to kind of recognize the team that very quickly used, learned to use this new system uh, for the most part. And we've combined it with a couple other innovative solutions. We're using a different calling tool to allow us to field phone calls all at the same time. Uh, we're using different ways to report on data. So uh, I thought, you know, this was a good story that came out recently. And, you know, I think people are using a lot of creativity to respond to what are kind of very serious needs here in our community. So we'll We'll keep doing that and just wanted to share that. Yeah, thanks for um, uh, bringing attention to that. I mean, it's, you know, if you think about normal times, we could easily spend months, maybe a year, uh, figuring out a software solution for a problem um, and going through a procurement process and whatnot. We didn't have that luxury here in this emergency and uh, repurposing um, C Click Fix to immediately uh, create the infrastructure for this was was uh, was a great move. So um, uh, Luke, thanks to the team at the RRC and, uh, and all you're doing. Why don't you stick around to see if there's questions um, and, and stick around for this as well. So so we have one, tonight's a, a busy night at the city council meeting. One of the things that's happening is there will be a public hearing, a former pub, formal public hearing on the city's use of $450,000 of community development block grant funds that we have received from the federal government as part of the initial federal response to coronavirus. And um, we are looking to get this money deployed uh, into the community quickly. Um, and we are looking at doing that in a combination of uh, two new programs. One targeted as a renter relief program um, and the other is a small business relief program. We, these are conceptual programs uh, at this point. We're looking for, for feedback on those concepts. And, um, and people are welcome to uh, Zoom in tonight for the public forum uh, to, to give comment um, or to get feedback to the RRC through, through other means as well. The hope is to take that feedback and, and get these programs announced uh, soon as possible. I, I think June is, is uh, when we will have more to share about each of them. Um, you know, the, the, both of them um, 
let's say just a little bit more about, about each. I mean, look, do you want to, do you want to share more? Or, or I'm happy to get some initial thoughts. Yeah, I'm uh, happy to, you know, maybe just, I can kind of tell you how you instructed us to go at this problem. You know, we had this source of funding, we had so many needs and, uh, you know, the team uh, at CETO for the most part, that is, uh, that every year sort of amends our action plan, decides how to uh, deploy these CDBG funds to our into our community, both directly and indirectly to the nonprofits working our, in our community, kind of assessed what the needs were and your priorities and sort of the city's priorities and found that really um, kind of this rent relief, small business relief uh, for, especially for businesses employing low and moderate income employees or owned by someone who's low and moderate income, uh, the low barrier shelter and food access were and have enormous priorities that we needed to direct funding towards. And we've kind of few, uh, through analysis and evaluation and matching some of what's going on at the state level, uh, we decided that kind of focusing on the rent relief and the small business relief programs with the CDBG funds was gonna be uh, the easiest way to get those dollars out into the community as quickly as possible. I'm happy to go into any other detail if you'd like me to. I think that's a good summary. I mean, we, we've talked a lot on this briefing about the need for um, food security assistance, and, and that clearly is, is one just uh, uh, urgent area. Um, just behind that, uh, clearly, um, renters uh, who have lost their ability to work and, and secure paychecks and, and suddenly face very uh, stark challenges needing their uh, rent payments Hopefully many of these individuals are getting help through the programs that have been set up from the federal government, but we're worried those programs don't go far enough. Um, and then secondly, we, we, you know, we know we're gonna have to fight to, uh, for our small businesses if we hope to have the same kind of vibrant downtown on the other side of this pandemic as we enjoyed for years going into it. So um, I think it's, it's great to have these, thanks for you and your team, Luke, for moving quickly to get this these programs before the council, uh, for the public, for this hearing tonight, we'll keep talking about them and have um, news uh, for the, the media and the public as we get closer to uh, being able to open these up for application and, and disbursement. So um, thanks again. Um, speaking of our hard hit and outstanding retailers that um, <clears throat> really define so much of what downtown Burlington is about, um, we are joined by Kara al Nazrawi, who is the Church Street Marketplace Director and has been heading up the small business relief efforts. And um, today's a big day in the effort to save our retailers, uh, for, Governor, fortunately, because um, the virus has been suppressed so substantially uh, since mid-March here in Chittenden County uh, through the sacrifice and efforts of Chittenden County residents, Vermont residents, we are in position to uh, have retailers open back up today. And uh, that it's not business as normal by, by any means. The uh, <clears throat> retailers are only allowed to operate right now at 25% capacity, and it's not clear when they'll be able to go further than that, um, which is one of the reasons that we are uh, focused on an initiative that we think could help in that respect. Cara, welcome. You wanna say um, a little bit more about what we're working on? Yeah, sure. So um, thank you, Mayor, and hello to everyone. Uh, yeah, today is a big day for retail. As you know, it's been closed since uh, mid-March and um, retailers have been um, doing their best to find creative solutions, um, obviously including online sales, sales through social media and things of that sort. Um, they've been doing um, local delivery and curbside pickup, and now they can finally open their doors. Um, they, the employees of all establishments are required to wear masks, and they will be. Um, these establishments can open at 25% capacity. Um, and for further clarification on that, that works out generally to about five customers per thousand square feet. Um, and I have been in touch with a lot of retailers this morning and it seems to be going very well. 
Um, not every local retailer has chosen to open yet. Some of them are still trying to um, get the proper training for their staff and make sure that they have the right cleaning supplies on hand. Again, I wanna highlight that um, these retailers definitely have the public's health and safety in mind. And I've been working with them for weeks to get set up so that they can be a safe environment for the public to go to. Um, we will be seeing more of them open in the next uh, week or so um, and as they establish their new procedures and they feel comfortable having guests in their establishment. In addition, um, the trend we are seeing is that outdoor seating and vending is going to be a a main source, a main economic driver in communities throughout the country and especially in our community as well. So to that end, the city has been working to expand um, outdoor seating and vending. And um, we've been really working hard on this for a while. There's three main components to this program. One is uh, what we call grab and go parking spaces and they're designated for curbside pickup and takeout and those can be for retail and restaurants. And in addition, we are working on a streamlined uh, application process to allow establishments to sell outdoors and have seating in the green belt and the parking spaces in front of their establishments. So it, you can view that as an expansion, uh, sort of an emergency expansion of our parklet program that was launched last year. Um, in addition, we've been hearing from a lot of restaurants and retailers that it would be helpful if we could close some city streets and allow um, establishments to set up tables or vending booths um, throughout the whole street. And we're looking into those options as well. Good, Cara. Thanks for that additional detail on the public right of way um, uh, effort. Um, the, uh, the goal here is to have this app applications for this um, uh, for any establishment that is interested in some expanded space um, very soon. We're shooting for uh, right at the either the end of this week or the beginning of next week, right, Cara? And, yep. um, and then our hope is for a very quick approval process so that uh, we can have um, these establishments so long as they are um, uh, supported by the governor, um, and I think the retailers I think would be today, but in, in service dining has not been green lighted yet by the governor, even if it's outdoors. Um, uh, so what we want, we want to be ready um, when those approvals come. And we think this is relatively speaking, um, you know, outdoor, we, we continue to be encouraged by the science suggesting that if you're taking precautions in these outdoor areas, if there is appropriate distance, um, people are wearing, um, uh, servers are wearing masks. Obviously you can't wear masks while eating, but um, if people are basically taking the right steps, uh, it, it can be quite, um, quite limited virus transmission uh, possibilities when in, in these outdoor settings. So we're gonna keep pursuing that. We'll have more, uh, we'll, we'll come back, have you back or, somehow have more discussion when the applications are up and ready to go. Um, relatedly, um, appreciate you making a point about employees wearing masks. We do expect tonight, and one of the actions that the council will take is on Councilor Joan Shannon's resolution that will uh, use this authority that the governor uh, granted to municipalities on Friday uh, that allows municipalities to require uh, retail customers to um, wear masks as well. Um, it really, um, uh, again, all of the science around mask wearing suggests that transmission is brought down 50% or even considerably more in some studies um, if people are properly wearing masks. And so I do expect that will pass from the council tonight. That will become immediately uh, face covering will be required um, when people are, are entering retailers. A couple other um, things to look for on tonight's, tonight's city council meeting, which you can join through CCTV uh, as usual or the Zoom stream if you wish to make public comment. Um, and the way you sign up for that is to email that address there in the final bullet. 
the other topics that will be in front of the council tonight that we haven't really touched on yet in this briefing are an update from the city and UVM about the June 1st move out, move in issues. Always something that uh, there's some focus on and possible disruption. And even in a good year this year, um, people are appropriately asking questions about what is going to be in place to minimize the chance of someone coming from another part of the country and bringing the virus with them. I think it's on people's minds knowing that there are hot spots in other parts of the region. We'll talk about that. There will be an update for City Place as well as expected executive session on City Place. Uh, Cambrian Rice has an amendment to the development agreement going to the council tonight. It was at the, uh, the CDNR committee a couple weeks ago um, and had support. Um, this, is the, this is the change that um, will uh, allow um, uh, a, uh, the up to the maximum uh, zoning uh, limitation, uh, number of homes to be built on the site that um, it is currently limited by the development agreement. There's a proposed change to that as well as an additional contribution the developer will be making to the uh, bike path connection through the uh, Cambrian Rise property. And there's even more than that. There's a Champlain Parkway uh, amendment to the design contracts. There's a lot going on. So check out the uh, <coughs> board docs, the city's online tool for um, materials for the council meeting get the links there to join the zoom stream or just watch the old-fashioned way on cctv and again there's the link if you'd like to participate in the public forum i think is that it olivia should we, we have a few time a few minutes for questions yes um and we do have some questions coming in from members of the media. Um, if you're a member of the media who's watching, reminder to send me an email at olivia at burlingtonvt.gov to let me know that you have questions. And then um, we're trying this new thing where I am enabling your microphone and uh, you can ask your question directly. So our first question is from Erin Brown at WCAX. And Erin, I do see you here in the Zoom attendees list. So I am going to try to enable your microphone and um, you can ask your question directly. Let's see if this works. Okay, Erin, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Hi guys, can you hear me? Yes, Erin, I can hear you. Welcome. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I, I have two questions here, if that's all right. Um, Go ahead. My first question is, what exactly can we expect to learn in tonight's City Place update. So, Aaron, um, that briefing's being finalized. Uh, after after this is over, I'll be working on that with Jeff Glassberg, who is our um, the city's point person, um, and we'll we'll have that uh, update at the very beginning um, of the the council meeting at six o'clock, and encourage people to tune in then. Um, certainly, uh, you know, as I've said in past weeks, like everything else, the Safe Place Project has been impacted, um, and we'll have some a uh, little bit of detail on that. Um, and I uh, hope, hope you'll be able to join us then for a further discussion. Got it. I will definitely be there. Great. Um, and my second question um, What are your thoughts on City Council's proposal to require all Burlington shoppers to wear a mask? Do you support that? Yeah, no, I, I totally support that, um, Aaron. And in fact, we worked, the administration worked with the governor's administration last week to ensure that um, the council could take this action tonight. Um, we um, understood that the governor um, wasn't clear, um, you know, wanted, the, the governor to this point has not mandated this statewide, but what he did do on Friday, we believe, um, in part because of the city's advocacy on this was to say that retail that municipalities that want to uh, go further than the baseline order from the governor that wants to require customers to wear masks can do so uh, through an action of the legislative bodies of those municipalities. So we were pleased to uh, have the governor grant this authority on Friday and we were ready uh, with Councilor Shannon um, and other counselors to put this in front of the body tonight. And um, I am hopeful that it will have strong support from the council and we'll go into effect immediately. Uh, that, uh, 
uh, if we have everybody, both customers and employees of businesses wearing masks in Burlington establishments, that is going to substantially cut down on virus transmission now and in the months ahead. And um, I know there's some inconvenience in doing this. I know, you know, it's not, I don't love wearing a mask, but um, it is a rel relatively small inconvenience and one that is very clear is a key strategy for suppressing the, the virus and making it possible really for our businesses to operate again. This is a great example of how getting our public health interventions right is gonna allow our economy to bounce back and, and get going. And I, I um, you know, I expect and hope that Burlingtonians will support this change um, and uh, that there will be a high level of compliance with this. Very nice. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Good to see you. We'll see you tonight. See you then. Thank you. And our next question is from Aiden Quigley at VT Digger. Aiden, you should be able to enable your microphone. Great. Uh, so I also have two questions. Uh, question number one is, does the city have any plans to enforce a retail mask uh, resolution? Is there any enforcement power uh, you know, associated with that? Yeah, in, um, great question. Certainly the initial, um, the initial focus, as with other uh, elements of the <clears throat> physical distancing orders, stay home orders that have been issued, the, the focus first is going to be on education uh, initiatives and, and getting the information out. Um, I do expect the great, great majority of Burlingtonians to voluntarily comply or certainly comply if they're asked to do so in an establishment. Um, I, um, we do have enforcement ability for other aspects of the stay home order. And frankly, Aiden, I meant to confirm before today um, whether that authority applies to this uh, or we need to get new authority. And I'll, I'll follow up with you after this briefing on that question. Uh, I'm actually not certain the answer to that question. I want to be precise about it. So we'll, we'll follow up with you before the end of the day as to whether um, the, the ability to find that um, exists for um, other aspects. We'll, we'll, we'll confirm on that. Thanks. Uh, and then my second question is, what is your position on the resolution tonight on the mural, uh, removing it by the end of August? You know, I've, I, I supported the process that led to the recommendation that the mural should come down um, in 22. So I, I supported the, setting up the process to review the mural. I had concerns about it. I supported that finding that was in the council resolution. I signed that resolution, committing the city to taking it down, removing it by 2022. And um, I'm, I'm directionally supportive of uh, of an acceleration of that schedule if there's a majority of the council that now wants to go in that direction. There, there were, um, I think that it's possible there may be, you know, this is one of those resolutions that there's, I, I'm aware of some work going on to it up until the end, there could be amendments. So you know, I, I guess until there's, I wanna see the, the final language before uh, fully committing to it, but I, I'm definitely directionally supportive of the acceleration um, of that timetable. Great. And I think those are our only questions for members of the media. Um, we still have a couple minutes up until three o'clock here. So I think we might have time for one question from a member of the public um, who is watching on the Facebook live stream and wrote a question in the comments. Um, so this is a, a question. Um, it might be for Luke. Um, and the question is from Megan Humphrey, who's asking about the um, the graph of the request that the RRC has received. And Megan is wondering um, that it looks like there aren't requests about food in that uh, pie chart that we showed there. And she is wondering if that is correct um, because she knows that uh, she is partnering with the city to get food to low-income seniors. So Luke, maybe you can speak to how those requests are being logged and, and if they're represented in that pie chart. Uh, yeah, that's a good
Good question. Can you hear me okay, Olivia? Yes. Um, yeah, so we created uh, a number of issuers. So what you're seeing on that pie chart is essentially the back end of C -click Fix, how we tag uh, certain issues as they come in. And that's evolved over time, mainly based on the type of calls we've been getting, calls and emails. So the issues you see there is, main, it, you know, it sort of reflects uh, the type of issues we're getting. Uh, we have gotten some food calls and those are mainly uh, in that miscellaneous category. Um, and I believe you also may see some overlap with the physical health category. So I'll have to check with the team, but that's where I think uh, some of those types of inquiries have been tagged. I'll also say, you know, many of these uh, questions when they come in, uh, you know, one person will have multiple needs. So if someone's calling uh, who's experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity, they're often experiencing food insecurity as well. And our team is able to match them uh, to those resources as needed. Uh, so, you know, the, the chart that you're seeing is uh, mostly accurate to the type of demand we're getting, but there are some areas that aren't completely covered. I mean, the, the issues are being uh, covered, but the data isn't reflecting all of the activity that's going on through the RRC. Great. And it looks like those are all of our questions for today. Great. All right. Thanks, Olivia, for putting together another briefing, for all your help pulling this off. Uh, thank you, everyone who tuned in, Luke, Kara, Will, and we, uh, we will have another live stream going in just a few hours for the Board of Finance meeting and, and the City Council meeting. Uh, again, these meetings taking place uh, totally virtually for, for now, um, and uh, I expect for some, some period of time. Um, uh, enjoy the nice weather out there, everybody. I hope, uh, I hope you can get out and, um, and, uh, and think about uh, whether, uh, I think it's important for everyone to know that, that we are continuing to take, take steps in the, in the right direction here. And Burlington, some Burlington retailers are, are back open again, as we discussed earlier. Um, bring a mask with you uh, uh, if you are headed to a Burlington retailer. Um, check out their websites because not, they're not all open. But um, uh, I think uh, everyone should uh, start this week with a, a, a sense that um, because your commitment and hard work, again, as we've been discussing in recent weeks, uh, more, more of the of the city and the region are, are starting to open up, and we're going to continue to take these incremental steps, uh, careful steps, but steps in the right direction uh, towards reopening our, our 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 community. So we'll have more tonight. Also, check out. We'll be back again on Wednesday for another 2 p.m. briefing. Is the plan? Also, 9 a.m. that morning, we'll have a different kind of conversation that we have at the. Uh, at the virtual coffees that we have every week at, at 9 a.m. Check out the mayor's Facebook page for um, the link to, to that. And uh, then we'll be back, be back again on Friday as well. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you later.